Hello oh, there, this is a presentation from APHL 2016 in June, and we're going to be talking about cannabis microbiome sequencing and a little bit of cannabis genetics here. Um, I'm uh, wearing two hats in that um, I'm a CSO at Corrigin Life Sciences, where we sequence about a thousand patients a month in a CLIA and CAP certified uh, regulated setting. Uh, and many of those patients end up being patients with epilepsy, autism, developmental delay, sometimes mitochondrial disease, uh, and liposomal storage diseases. And, and many of those patients are inquiring about uh, safe access uh, to CBD. Um, so this has got us interested in uh, medicinal genomics, which is a wholly owned sub where we focus primarily on cannabis genetics. And lately, we've been paying close attention to um, cannabis microbiomes. Uh, when we take a clinical view of the safety profiles of cannabis, it is indeed very um, safe from a recreational standpoint. When you begin to look at its um, its use in, in immunocompromised patients or in seizure-prone patients, uh, the safety profiles need to be scrutinized a little bit more. Uh, and there are, in fact, some case studies of fatalities with cannabis in the, in the clinical literature. Arguably, most of these are secondary, and they've mostly been from uh, aspergillus infections in the lungs of immunocompromised patients. So these are uh, mold spores that are making their way through the, uh, the production process. So we focus most of our attention not on measuring um, CBD and THC levels. Patients seem to have a very wide tolerance for those, but in fact for microbial harms that could be present. And this is going to lead into some discussions about pesticides. So we did publish a paper this year on this very topic, uh, it's in an F1000, and it describes a quantitative PCR method uh, that we use to try and assess microbial burden on cannabis products. Uh, this is currently done with uh, petri dishes in, in culture-based systems. Petri dishes were invented not last century, but the century before that. Um, they, uh, they have their place, but what you're going to see from some of the work in this paper is that um, they're not very specific in terms of what they're measuring. Uh, and this is going to lead um, to a very important um, point in this presentation and as we discuss pesticides. So this quantitative PCR assay um, can also be sequenced. And uh, the reason for doing so is that the sequence of this particular amplicon will precisely pinpoint the DNA on the phylogenetic tree of life. Uh, these are what are known as ITS sequences, and so we target the 18S region of the ITS uh, sequences to discern yeast and mold, and the 16S side of it to discern um, total aerobic count. Now, in doing so, we can get a quantitative PCR signal that gives us an approximation of the microbial burden that's actually on the plant from both the 16S and 18S um, side of the amplicons. And we certainly have a handful of other um, species-specific ones as well that are regulated in a few states, but we're primarily going to be focusing on these two today. So this quantitative PCR signal then turns into a very large dynamic range that you could measure. Um, dynamic range means uh, we get about six logs of sensitivity in measuring these things, and you can't get that in a petri dish. You can plate things, and you can maybe tolerate 100 to 1,000 colonies in a plate, but uh, you probably need to do several dilutions to get to the, um, the type of dynamic range that you would see with a quantitative PCR machine. So these quantitative PCR it, um, signals, if they are of interest to you and they're beyond some threshold, and you need to enumerate and identify exactly what these are, uh, you can then graduate them to sequencing and give you a microbiome ID. These microbiome IDs um, provide you what is a OTU count, a little bit of a misspelling there in the slide, but it, it stands for in a organizational taxonomic unit. Uh, and the, that's what's being used in, in microbiome studies today. It 
to classify these things. So um, being a clinical laboratory, the first thing you have to put forward with your assay is to understand how reproducible it is. Um, so if you perform this uh, process of sequencing uh, month to month, we get very, very tight R squares hitting the same samples over and over again. All right, these are R squares of 0.99 or higher. Uh, and so um, that's very reassuring that whenever we go to measure things month after month, um, we, um, we were given the same result. A lot of that is probably due to the fact that these are, is digitizes um, the quantitation problem with individual reads, and we sequence millions of them per, per sample, and that gives us a tremendous amount of information content. So, um, the, an interesting detail is that the vast majority of microbes are actually unculturable. This is, this is known in the field. There's about maybe 2% of them that are actually culturable. And you can see that in this case here, we had um, three different technologies from Simplate, 3M, and Biolumex um, all attempt uh, to capture any microbial signal from this. And uh, there's, they're blank. There's no yeast and mold according to their assays. Yet when we go in there with DNA primers, uh, we can see that there is, in fact, um, quite a bit of microbial DNA. Actually, this, this sample would fail. And um, now this naturally evokes questions of whether it's live or dead, and that is easily discerned by simply running this PCR reaction both before and after uh, a culturing period. And even though these petri dishes may not have the sensitivity to be picking um, any type of growth up, you can see a shift in the in the CQ, implying there's more DNA after than was before, and there's a little bit of growth going on. Now, it turns out, when we go to sequence this, we discover what these bugs were. And it's no surprise now that these weren't growing. Um, Penicillium uh, paxilli and citrinum are, are two that keep popping up in this slide. This is the DNA sequencing profile of all the bugs that are present uh, on a few of these samples, and KDA was the one that you were looking at before. And that one, uh, it turns out, you can in fact culture some of those bugs at lower temperatures and longer periods of time. And the times that were utilized for these um, experiments were within maybe three to five, three to four days. And that's uh, perhaps we need a lower temperature and longer time to actually pick this up in, in culture. But nevertheless, you can see it with DNA. We know that it's living. Uh, however, these are microbes that have never been described in any AHP before. Uh, that is a monograph that is, uh, has recommendations on how to actually, what bugs to actually focus on in, uh, for safety testing. Uh, so they're not at any, anyone's rate. Are, and they should be. And the reason they should be is that they make these compounds, uh, respectively. They make citrinum and paxiline, and both of these compounds are lipid soluble and likely to co extract with a CO2 extraction of CBD. Um, now, we, um, knowing that these compounds uh, and these, these bugs could make these, these compounds, uh, we had to go confirm that the gene was actually there. Uh, it's one thing to get an ITS signal and tell you it's, what genus it is. They, they can occasionally get the species wrong at, at that level, but they can nail the genus. And so we went in and targeted the genes that actually make these compounds. Um, the, Paxilin, the Pax-P gene is the one in Paxiline, and, and the Citrinum gene is the one in, in, um, in uh, Penicillin Citrinum. And both of those genes were present. We got high coverage uh, of sequencing over them with high quality information that the gene's present. Um, now, the important thing to know about these compounds, uh, Paxiline actually is a nanomolar drug. It's a potassium channel blocker. Most of the cannabinoids are micromolar drugs, meaning people are using a thousand times more of it. So a 1% contamination of something like Paxiline um, can in fact be a risk. It may have more potency than the CBD that it's actually contaminating. Why do we care? Well, we care because there have been publications showing that this potassium channel blocker actually has an impact on cannabidiol. There's a published contraindication with it in mice that it actually reverses the anti-seizure properties of CBD. So if this is floating around in any of the CBD extractions, um, there's going to be some variable results. Uh, likewise, citrinum is uh, a nephrotoxic agent that seems to be playing a role in the pathway that Duncan Ryan published in the mitochondria, uh, where CBD is thought to operate. So um, this naturally raises some concern. So 
Now, all this being said, uh, we know that the bugs are there. We know the genes are there that make these toxins. We don't actually have evidence that they made the toxins. Um, and that's an important um, detail because DNA sequence doesn't always equal expression. So we've gone about um, working with Digipath Labs to, to replicate Ulig et al.'s LCMSMS protocol to pick up Paxilene. Um, this is a very difficult um, uh, LCMSMS assay. Uh, it's a very, as you can tell, it's a very large molecule. It fragments quite a bit when you when you fly it, and um, as a result, um, it has been a little bit difficult to extract. So we now have a method where we have spiked sigma-based Paxilene into into samples and demonstrated that we can detect it, but we lose about um, tenfold sensitivity when we try to assess Paxilene in as a standard versus when it is spiked into a, the background cannabis matrix. And we don't understand that yet. We're trying to figure that out um, and, and, and make the assay more sensitive so that we can actually deploy this um, at the sensitivities that are required to pick up nanomolar drugs. So there's still more to be told there. Now, that's perhaps the, um, the dark side of the story of what microbes could there. We're going to switch over to the positive side uh, of microbes, which is that most microbes are actually beneficial, and we're not doing a very good job of weeding those out either. In fact, you can see some of this data presented at SC, from SC Labs at KenMed in uh, April 2016, and they were demonstrating effectively 14% microbial failures, um, almost 15% when you add in all the other um, coliforms and E. coli that are there. And the reason those don't all add up to 22% is that some samples may fail for multiple reasons. So it's about a, almost about a 15% in total microbial failure. And this is a fairly wet season just before the Emerald Cup that occurred, so maybe this is artificially high. Um, but this is having a profound effect. In the marketplace, in that when people get microbial fails, oftentimes the uh, microbial uh, microbial tests are regulated, uh, and the pesticides are not. That happens in many states, and as a result, people throw on the pesticides to kill the microbials. Um, and this has um, led us into some pretty uh, dark corners in the cannabis industry in that people are using uh, Eagle 20, which is known to be safe to consume, but it's not been known to be safe to actually smoke. If you actually heat this pesticide up, it creates cyanide, uh, um, hydrogen cyanide, which is you know, nothing you want to inhale. So um, this, this is a bit of a positive feedback loop. If we have lots of false positive testing on these yeast and mold platforms that cannot discern harmful from beneficial microbes, people use more pesticides. When in reality the solution is we should be um, being more specific with our microbial testing so that we can in fact use less pesticide and fail less things for microbial. So in summary what we're seeing is a, a fair number of microbes that actually grow in these culture systems that aren't the target microbe. Um, and and it's, it's, it's more problematic with the total yeast and mold assays, because these grow for long periods of time, and bacteria have such a faster doubling time than, than yeast and mold that small amounts of contamination of those onto those cartridges can in fact um, outgrow yeast and mold. How do we know this? Um, well, we know this from some sequencing work I'm going to show you, but, but more importantly, before we, we go there, he, he, here is a graph of um, the different types of pesticides that are being found at SC Labs uh, in the nor Northern California area. And you can see the large bulk of them are Eagle 20, which is the uh, that mic mic microbutanol um, graph over there by the right. So um, this, is, uh, this is the hydrogen cyanide generating one when you actually heat it up, and it's an antifungal. So people are using, using this to knock down their yeast and mold counts. Uh, and if those yeast and mold counts are in fact false because there's bacteria, um, particularly uh, harmless bacteria or beneficial microbes that are present, uh, then we're going to be throwing on pesticides um, to the cows come home and make no impact on this. Uh, effectively, we're just going to have uh, some microbes that probably aren't sensitive to that stuff that are slipping right through because they're bacteria. Um,
So this brings us to an interesting experiment. Uh, what, we're gonna, what we do here is we take DNA right off the plant um, with the uh, same process that you use to put uh, the microbes into culture so that they can go onto 3M films or go onto a biomary U cartridge. These things take three to five days to grow. Um, Biomutex 3. But uh, these, uh, these systems um, are slightly different in how they grow. They're probably, one's a bit more of a solid medium, the other one has chlorinfenicol, the, the one in the biomary U cartridge has chlorinfenicol, which is an antibiotic. But we take DNA both before growth and after they have grown uh, for the period of time, and then measure the results on quanti quantitative PCR with our primers. What we have are known as 16S and 18S primers. Those, those represent our TAC and our total use in mold primers, respectively. And we get quantitative PCR numbers, and then um, in interesting cases, we go in and sequence them to see what's actually contributing to those signals. Okay, uh, you know another another form of this looks like this. Just uh, one plant. Uh, some material goes straight from the plant to qPCR. Other stuff grows for three days and. Uh, voila. So some questions that arise are, do original microbials match post-culture microbials? Uh, and uh, that's interesting if they don't, right? What does that say if they don't? Uh, what percent of the CFU per gram are actually yeast and mold? And uh, well, let's take a look at this. Well, here's a case where we have CQs that are from qPCR. So uh, we've got a little bit of tax signal, which is going from 24 to, th to 30, which means the bacterial count was very high to begin with, but went down over time. And the yeast and mold started off undetectable and went to 20, which is a very high level, would fail. Uh, so this could be a case where some of the fungi are actually eating the bacteria over time. And what we see from the other platforms is uh, no capacity to detect any bacteria, and 23 is actually a very high CQ for bacteria, um, no capacity to detect any of that in either of those two platforms, so a little bit on the biomary U tag platform, and most of it comes off uh, as signal in their yeast and mold kits. Now it's important to know the 3M um, bacterial growth uh, is is quicker than the um, uh, than, than the yeast and mold, which takes many days, but it wasn't available for this particular experiment. Uh, we only had the Biomary U tac numbers and the Biomary U yeast and mold. Um, but nevertheless, um, they both fail them for yeast and mold, uh, and uh, in our setting it would fail as well for yeast and mold, but the interesting artifact here is that the counts could arguably be elevated. And with yeast and mold testing, 10,000 CFUs is per gram is the cutoff, and we start to question how much of this is actually, of the 10,000 CFUs per gram, is actually being contributed by the bacteria. Um, so, well, we can have the answer to this. easily uh, by sequencing. So we go about sequencing about a million reads per sample, and then we can chart the before and after number of OTUs that we see. These are again these operational taxonomic units, um, and the number of read counts that are hitting each of those OTUs puts them on these axes for both before and after. And what you see is that there's a lot of material that had uh, it has plenty of sequence capacity after uh, the growth, but was almost at zero or not present at all before the growth. And these are all bacteria. You can see a lot of them um, popping out, with the exception of the one in red, all of these bacterial species are having, are growing like gangbusters uh, in these yeast and mold cartridges. Um, we also have a subset of them that look that have more of an even slope, and uh, those are, are obviously microbes that are growing um, quite well. Uh, they're present before and they're present after, but they're probably not growing as quickly as the ones on the horizontal line where they had almost no capacity or, or very little presence um, bef the before data, but were clearly at high copies in the, in, in the uh, after data. And this, the stuff that's boxed off there are hits to plant genomic DNA background. That's just an artifact of the method that we're using. Um, 
Uh, and so let's take a look at what's going on in the 18S side of this. Again, the last picture again was using 16S PCR and sequencing those to tell us how much bacteria was present on a yeast and mold cartridge or a yeast and mold um, 3M plate. Uh, we can run the same experiment here looking at 18S, which asks us how much mold is actually present on the mold plates. This is what they should be good at detecting, and in fact you do see a much more linear curve here with nothing on, not much going on in either of the small axes there. Um, but again, a lot of Penicillium citrinum, but also some fungal endophytes that are probably harmless. So there's, um, you know, there's a mixed picture here, and ideally we need to itemize what the number of risk factors that are here versus the number of benign um, fungal endophytes. If you zoom in on that axis, you will see a little bit going on down um, in the uh, on the before front, where there was plenty of signal of these things before, but they didn't move much after after growth. And this was Aspergillus niger and Fusarium. The, both of these can be a concern, actually. And the fact that they're not growing in this experiment, um, from our experience, is just because they're being outcompeted uh, in this milieu. Um, other words, we have seen cultures of, of uh, Aspergillus niger grow uh, quite effectively in these platforms, but they may not grow when uh, presented with a certain terpene profile or cannabinoid profile that's with this plant with all these other bugs. It's a bit of a competitive environment. Okay, so let's compare 3M versus BioMariU and look at 16S primers. Again, our TAC primers run on their yeast and mold platform. What do we see? Well, what we see from a sequencing standpoint is a lot of material that is sitting on the X and Y axes. Okay, these um, anything vertical here on the Y axes is material that did not grow on BioMariU but did grow on 3M. And likewise, on the other x-axis, we have things that grew very well in BioMariU, but didn't grow on 3M. So these two yeast and mold platforms have different preferences, and that probably isn't surprising because one of them has an antibiotic in it. But we're, again, we're getting lots of this um, uh, of these um, uncultured bacteriums and xanthomonas um, that's showing up. All of these dots out here towards the end are the same as, as xanthomonas. Um, and then in the other case, we're getting uh, a lot of bacillus strains. And some of these bacillus strains we know are in fact benign endophytes, but they're probably creating an artificially high CFU count on uh, on the yeast and mold plates. And then we have some, some material uh, in between here, which is growing in both platforms. Okay. So this, this certainly puts um, a lot of question in our minds about the use of this as a test, because um, if there is discordant data from before and after, then the time slice at which you assess the number of colony forming units becomes a bit of a Heisenberg uncertainty problem. The act of measuring these microbes actually changes the representation of them and the frequency of them, such that your final readout may have nothing to do with the initial risks that were originally present on the plant. Um, so th this naturally gets us into some more questions about, well, do the systems agree with one another? And, uh, you know, can you take averaging between multiple platforms? And, um, w you know, how do we dial in the specificity? city here. Um, well, here's an example of taking just 3M 18S data uh, versus uh, BioMariU. So if you look at, at the 18S data for this particular sample, uh, and you look at their what they're supposed to measure, which is total yeast and mold, the correlations aren't that bad. Um, our score is probably 0.8 or something on the, on the data set, but we do see both species, or, or both platforms are growing the fungal endo endophytes and the, and the penicillium species. Um, it seems to be somewhat um, equally. Um, when you begin to look at the correlations with the bacteria, they're really quite a mess uh, because of this fact that some selectively grow on one platform from the other. We get correlations that are more like 0.196, uh, but you can get them up to 0.992 in, in some of the best cases we've seen. Um, so the, these correlations are actually um, quite impressive, uh, but we don't see that in every single
sample. So what we do to address this on the PCR side um, is we can readily ask ourselves how many times when we use 18S primers, um, how many times do those actually generate 16S hits in GenBank? Right? They should target 18S, but there could be reasons for them to go off target. Um, and what we see is a very low number of off target hits. And then we can count the number of times we use 18S primers and get 18S hits, and the numbers are log scales higher. Um, we did this both with um, Biomary U and 3M grown material. Um, and you can also see this with our 16S primers. Um, with 16x hits, we get x number of OTUs that are being sequenced off of Biomary U uh, and off of 3M. And then likewise, uh, 16s primers, how many times do we get off-target 18x hits? And there seems to be a little bit higher off-target rate with Biomary U in that case, and we're, we're looking into that. But still, um, this is something that's actually quite measurable across uh, all species that are in GenBank. Um, getting this type of diverse validation on a culture plate means you have to have all those bugs from ATCC and you have to be able to culture them all and mix them all in different ratios and show that they all grow competitively and um, that's a very very hard validation to perform. Um, so um, just stepping back a little bit uh, if we really want to reduce pesticide usage, we have to have more specific microbial testing. If these culture systems are in fact growing an alternate number of, um, of bugs between the two different platforms, but also they show a shift from the, the presentation of the microbes during the course of growth, and they're incapable of picking up the, or, or discounting the beneficial microbes, uh, we're going to be encouraging a tremendous amount of pesticide use, which is a harder problem to actually QC and check because there's many more pesticides out in the marketplace that requires much more expensive technology to survey them. Um, we have also know uh, that beneficial microbes are known to reduce the need for pesticides. So if we can discount these beneficial microbes, uh, we can use pesticides at a much lower frequency. Um, and so what we believe beneficial microbes should not be included in any CFU per gram count. Uh, and that's something that's actually quite readily done with DNA-based techniques. It's not clear to us how one can do this with, with carbon. in source selectivity, um, but it's quite obvious how to do this with uh, with DNA. And of course, um, the state of Nevada agrees with us on this. They actually are now making a list of beneficial microbes that shouldn't be considered uh, on a yeast and mold test. Uh, and this is going to be very helpful for growers in the community to be able to resort to more organic approaches and utilize um, microbes instead of pesticides that we know are harmless um, in the process. So in, in summary, the, the current CFUs per gram that's out there has no bearing on safety. Um, there are plenty of bacteria that grow in yeast and mold culture on multiple different platforms. We've seen Staphylococcus, which is human-induced. We've seen Pseudomonas, which is quite ubiquitous, and there's only one that's harmful, which is Originosa. We've seen Propionobacteria, which is human-introduced acne. Uh, and we've also seen Bacillus, which are likely beneficial. All show up and grow and contribute to failures on yeast and mold plates when these are in fact bacteria, uh, and many of them harmless. Um, and then there's other forms of visible mold that you can see with your eye that don't grow at all on these things. All right, we remember the original paper failed to pick up a penicillin species that makes a trenum and paxillin. So the false negatives are just as frightening as the false positives. And of course the FDA understands this, and this is the direction that they're moving for food and safety testing, is they're moving to this genome tracker system that actually does DNA sequencing as opposed to culturing. And I think we should get cannabis on the... Uh -uh. on the same footing. Um, on that on that same front, uh, it's important for us, I think, to measure the genetics of all of these cannabis plants because some of them are eventually going to be pest resistant. And so toward a pest resistance model, we have been sequencing 
uh, several million bases in every plant we can get our hands on, the DNA at least. Uh, we, we don't actually accept any plant material into Massachusetts. It's only DNA based. Uh, but, but you can get this DNA from any part of the plant, including the stalk, um, purify its DNA, and just take 30 nanograms, sequence it with us in a, pro in a, in a, progress called, uh, or a product called StrainSeq, and we deliver about 10,000 to 30,000 SNPs um, that help put you on the phylogenetic tree, tell you how far the, your nearest relatives are, and, and uh, give you a sense of how inbred um, the, the, uh, the plant might be, and whether it needs any more hybrid vigor. This is all managed on a website known as Canopedia. Um, there are links to the metric system, to the case where these the samples have metric IDs from Colorado, uh, and we also run this through a blockchain databasing system that can act as a proof of existence system, okay? I'm going to spend a little bit of time describing proof of existence and what it means. Well, for intellectual property reasons, um, there are cannabis patents that are beginning to issue, and these patents, um, are, the claim language is likely going to change patent to patent, but some of them may include strains that have existed before. Uh, we don't know if they existed before because there has been uh, a a fair amount of doubt in the cannabis market as to whether names are really accurate. There's been too much uh, mislabeling and counterfeiting going on for anyone to really believe uh, the, uh, the written record here. Uh, and so um, it's quite possible that these strains existed before, but there isn't anything that the USPTO is going to consider prior art in a meaningful way. They want to have signed and notarized documents to prove um, proof of existence. And, and timestamps like this. You can't just say, I, I sold this uh, several years ago under this name and it's on this website. Um, they have no way to connect that name to real genotype. And these claims are starting to talk about genotypes. So what we do is we take your sequence file, as you see blue uh, up there in the upper left, and we run it through a program known as SHA-256. SHA-256 creates a fingerprint for your file, that if you change one letter in that file, that whole fingerprint changes. And so that, that uh, fingerprint for your file is kind of like an encryption key. Uh, you can go into court and demonstrate that your sequence file always generates that SHA-256 number. And this is a, it's a, um, a hashing algorithm that was designed by the NSA. Okay, so you can then spend a small amount of Bitcoin where you include that encryption key in the in the transaction. And when you do that, that encryption key then makes its way into a block on the blockchain, which is timestamped. There are new blocks being generated every 10 minutes. This has been going on since 2009. It's now a $7 billion marketplace where every computer uh, in the world that's trying to mine for Bitcoins, um, there's probably millions of them, uh, are dedicated to making sure that the veracity of this database never changes on all the computers that are contributing to the community. Okay, so we have millions of copies of this blockchain all over the planet, and if you get a transaction into one of those blocks, it gets replicated all over the world, and there's a very large $7 billion financial motivation to make sure that that ledger never changes. Um, okay, so this is as good as a digital notarization as you can ever get. You can't, you can easily falsify a notarization. You cannot falsify a Bitcoin transaction. So um, this is going to hold up in court. Our attorneys have looked at this and believe it's one of the best proof of existence systems out there. Uh, and so in doing so, you could show up in court and demonstrate that, look, I have this key in this transaction on this date. It opens up this sequencing file. And that block was dated in 2016. Therefore, my sequence had to exist in 2016, and therefore these genetics pre-exist these patents that are now issuing. Um, and it's important that you have this done uh, at least one year in advance of someone else's claim issuing uh, in order for you to have prior use exemption to their patent claim. So it's, it's more of a defensive shield than a sword, um, but it's a very cheap a defensive um, position to take from an IP standpoint. And so a lot of customers have been signing on to that and getting their material sequenced and etched into the blockchain so that if patents ever uh, emerge that try to encumber their own strains, they can prove that theirs was in business use um, ever since a certain block number and a certain timestamp. So with that, I want to thank many of the people here that helped get this data together. We had lots of help from the folks at DigiPath on, on, on the assay for Paxilene, uh, likewise from the folks at, at Proverti and from SC Labs and on, on a variety of the, of the microbial testing efforts. Uh, it's been a really productive relationship, and um, we ho hopefully uh, will have much more data to share on this in the, in the coming months. Thank you.